good morning everyone um, thank you for uh, coming to the opening session at uh, kerala literature festival um, we have today two sorry uh, we have two distinguished uh, highly accomplished uh, writers uh, from kannada with us today um each of their achievements the works that they have uh, done over the years over the last few decades runs into several pages so i'm going to make my uh, life easier for myself and uh, kindly request them to introduce themselves very briefly banu ma'am would you want to go first hey good morning everybody we are very excited to come from hasan karnataka hasan is a district place at uh, bank karnataka i am working there i am working as an advocate i have got my independent office there and basically my profession i am an advocate and my hobby i am a writer i write i am a novelist short story writer journalist and a poet also and one of my short story karima garukalu has been filmed by the great director girish kasarwali and the name is hasina hasina has won three national awards and it has entered international film festival also and it has won laurels in cannes film festival i am also an activist i work with women and the marginalized community of karnataka and basically my mother tongue is urdu but i write in Kannada. Hello, this is the third time I am coming to this Kodikot Beach Festival. It's always a pleasure to come back to Kerala. Two months ago I was in Ranakulam uh, for the Kerala Sahitya Parishad program. And uh, Kerala always has a good audience. So I am uh, depending on you to make this session uh, very interesting. I am a journalist, uh, poet, author and also a translator. Translation has been my profession. And I am also a filmmaker. And among other things, uh, let's see. I think that will do. Um, I don't think uh, anyone here, whether on, on stage or in the audience, needs to be reminded of uh, just how important the practice of uh, translation is. Uh, I think especially now, when we've always been translating, uh, there's a huge history of translation in India and abroad. And I think this year, thanks to uh, the Booker Prize, uh, that went to a Hindi novel this year, uh, translated uh, Gitanjali Shree's uh, Book of Sand, translated by Lady Rockwell. I think uh, translation is uh, rather fashionable. But I just want to remind everyone that uh, you know, when we translate a text, it's not uh, it's not a translation only between languages. It's also between cultures. We translate each other's cultures, and we do that even in daily life. Even if it's not just in uh, literature. So before we plunge deeper into the <coughs> Canada world specifically, I wanted to ask you both. How did you personally uh, start, or why did you personally start uh, this practice of uh, translation in your poems? Was there some motivation? What is it that uh, got you into this uh, speech? Well, anyone? See, for me, uh, translation as a profession, I was a technical translator with uh, NGO. and it was an electrical equipment uh, uh, public sector undertaking and the project was implementing kannada in the technical field and when we started it we had to first uh, create a technical dictionary and then to implement the regional we were actually among the first in india and hindi came little, little behind us actually we started doing the standardization of kannada letters to make the engineering uh, stencils possible and because of the, uh, the weirdness of kannada 
letters, it was a challenge and uh, many technicians uh, worked on it. But immediately after, the computers took over. So when the first uh, electronic computer came, we thought uh, we will lose out on that in Canada. But immediately, we, the Canada was adopting itself to the changing technology and we also discovered the Canada software. And then the fonts came. So Canada has been so in in step with the improving and ever changing technology that uh, we stopped worrying about it. Now we are very able to do with uh, any technical uh, technological changes or progress that happens in the world. We are in step with that. And then the literary translation and the the business translation in coach, if I may call it. They are two different uh, arenas actually. See, when we are, when I am doing a technical translation or a general translation or an official document or a legal document or a medical document or a technolo technological document, the aim is to convey what the original says. And there, the question of terminology is important but we can go through that by adopting the English terminology if there is no such word in Kannada or we can invent and then introduce that to the reader. So the, I mean we, even now being a professional translators, my aim is to reach what one language says into another language and make it very clear about it. That there is no need, there is no uh, <laughs> opportunity for misconception there. I have to be very clear in what the original document says and the same message has to, the same text has to reach the one who is reading it in another language, whether it's from Kannada to English or English to Kannada. But in literary translation, we can take a little liberty and take the gist of what the original author is saying and represent it in the language into which it is being translated. But I have a rule which I never break that you cannot add anything to the original text and you cannot delete anything from the original text. I have seen, uh, I have studied a lot of translations, literary translations especially, uh, poetry and uh, novels where the translator has left out a lot of chunk of original because that person could not understand or the person found it difficult to translate into the language into which it is being translated and I am dead against that. You cannot add anything, you cannot delete anything and if you stick to that, you can almost successfully convey what the original author is saying to the person who is reading it in the language into which it is translated. And uh, I have been translating for the past 50 years, so I have forgotten how I got into it. It's my day-to-day -day job because I get all kinds of uh, translation work and I also do subtitling. And the film subtitling is a different uh, art altogether because you have to have that one line, 24 characters, into that one frame. So when you are translating a creative work, especially in visual media, the subtitling, which is also a translation, requires a different kind of skill and uh, that also one has to, you know, be very good at, you know, acquire that skill. So me as a translator, act differently when I am translating an uh, official document or a technical document act differently when I am uh, translating a literary uh, or, uh, text and extremely differently when I am translating a game, for example, a video game or a film or anything that is that concerns something which is very time bound, and especially uh, frame bound. So these three are, uh, I am very aware that they are different kinds of translations and one has to you know, we really acquire the skill to do these and recognize the differences between these. And I think it's too long since I've been doing it, so I, I have forgotten how I started. I think that subtitling, uh, 
how you translate subtitles for film is a fascinating topic. Maybe we could come back to that if we have time. Uh, one, if you want to go with um, The thing is, the subject matter of discussion is also that the position of um, Kannada in Indian literature. I have introduced myself, but I need to introduce Kannada also in the context of Indian literature. Friends, this Kannada literature is the corpus of written form of Kannada language. A member of the Dravidian family spoken mainly in the Indian state of Karnataka and it has got its own independent lipi that is script. It has got the independent script. Malayalam, Tamil, Telugu, Konkani are the sister languages. In the 19th century, some literary forms such as the prose narratives, the novel and the short story were borrowed from English literature. Modern Kannada literature is now widely known and recognized <coughs> during the half century. Kannada language authors have received 8 Nyanupita Awards, 63 Sahitya Academy Awards and 9 Sahitya Academy Fellowships in India. It is next highest to Bengal, Bengali uh, literature. Kannada is in the second place in um, getting Nanupita Awards. Now, how I got into translation, it is something I was not willing to because I um, uh, exposed myself only towards the creative writings and I never bothered about the translations. But I was very fond about the Russian literature and Bengali literature which I, I, could be, I was able to read through translations only. So hence, but I was indifferent towards translations. But once during 2015, M.M. Kalburgi, he contacted me. M.M. Kalburgi is a renowned literary person in Kannada literature. He was murdered because of his views like Gauri Lankesh and he contacted me. Then he was the president of the Phaguru Halakatti Foundation in which Adil Shahi literature from Urdu was to be translated into Kannada. And uh, the uh, foundation secured all the manuscripts from Salarjan Museum Hyderabad. It, it was very voluminous. It was about 3,750 pages, a historian by the name Farishta, he visited Bijapur and he stayed there and he wrote the history of the entire India there. And the same has to be translated into Kannada. It was a voluminous work and uh, 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 about 250 pages were allotted to each translator and I was given about 500 pages to translate it. It was a very hard and tough job because that Urdu, though my mother tongue is Urdu, that Urdu which I was about to translate was highly Persianized. The Persian words were abundant rather than uh, Urdu because in Hyderabad, Mysore state, we use a Dakri Urdu whereas this is the highly Persianized Urdu and it is very, it was very tough. And I rejected the offer, I said no, I can't go through this work because it is uh, not Urdu, it is Persian and I don't know Persian. But M.M. Kalburgi, he was uh, adamant and he said, no, only you can translate this, please do the work, it is a great job and you have to do it. And he insisted with that, I started translating it and I loved the job of translation and I loved it. And he was very much impressed and he said, the translation of your Urdu, highly Persian and his Urdu, is uh, very much applauding and I like it. And then I translated from Hindi Kishan Patnai that was due to our Advocate General because I am uh, towards advocacy and he wanted me to translate the Kishan Patnai. Now I am translating right now. Uh, being a Muslim, the condition of Muslim in India written by journalist Ghazala Wahab and I am translating this work. 
and gradually, though unwillingly, I was drawn into translation and I am keeping it up. Since you mentioned uh, M.M. Kalburgi, I was reminded of something he's, uh, he's, he told I think, one of his students that uh, a person is closest to any particular text when he or she is translating it and also, sorry, can you put the mic? Uh, so the person is closest to the text when he or she is translating uh, that particular text you know, or in another situation when someone is performing something from, uh, from it. So in terms of Kannada translation, uh, I want to ask you how do you see the state of uh, translation in Kannada right now, whether it is from Kannada to some other language or from some other language to uh, to Kannada. And just to sort of larger contextualize it, I, I'm, I'm asking this because um, if you see Indian publishing, and I'm speaking only in terms of uh, Kannada to English uh, translation, uh, compared to say the other uh, major South Indian languages like Tamil, or Malayalam, or uh, even Hindi for, for that matter, the number of translations we see from Kannada to English is uh, comparatively very low. Whereas in Tamil, you would probably see one every uh, week or one every month. And it's the same in Malayalam also. We've had some fantastic uh, translations in uh, recent times. So, why do you think that, I mean, it's not like there is no interest. We have obviously, like Bangla said, we have some brilliant uh, writers who Nyanapita awardees and uh, some fabulous uh, writers over the years. So why is it that we are not seeing those, you know, that many uh, translations from Kannada into into English? And here I'm specifically mentioning English because that's what gives, uh, you know, sort of a larger publicity, so to speak, for, for, for that book. So what? how do you see the state of uh, translation in Kannada? See, the, there is no uh, doubt that we have had translation is a part and parcel of the modern, even in ancient time there was translation from Sanskrit. But uh, <laughs> translation is a par part of it from the beginning. It, I wouldn't say it's a new phenomenon. But the thing is, there is a dearth for good translators. I have seen some uh, Kannada works in English which are horrible, absolutely horrible translations and I don't know why, in, in fact it is better not to publish every month than to have a horrible translation. Somebody translated Kovampu's poems into English and Vendre's poems into English which were horrible, you know. So there is a dearth for good translators, I really think that. There are some good translators. Of course, Nikhil Ramanujan started it all. He put Kannada on the world map. So, of that caliber, there are very few, very very few. That is the reason actually. It's not that the and and the, the second part of uh, that is a very good Kannada novel or a poem when translated into English, loses its essence actually. In, in the translation, it doesn't sound as good as it sounds in, in Kannada, in the original. Even the Chittals and novels, you know, when you, when it was started, uh, when we started translating it, halfway through it fell down, because in Kannada it, it may sound very good, but in English, it doesn't. In fact, uh, last month I got an offer to translate something. I was negotiating with a publisher to translate uh, one biography of somebody, uh, cancer, cancer survivors, and immediately the publisher said that in English we have better books on this. So it was not adding anything specific or anything special to the English uh, literary world. That is the reason. If we have good translators who can pick up good works and put it in English in such a way that it should read like English and it should attract uh, the attention. And one very one example for a very good translation is uh, Devnur Mahadeva's uh, Kusma Bali. Though it was written in a dialect in Kannada, in English it has come out so well. So if we have a good translator, we can have uh, as many as we want. 
they actually their translations are very important even to Karnataka and to Kannada language because with so many economic, religious, cultural and political injustices and schisms in our world, it seems that anything that would bring us closer to understanding one another certainly deserves some sort of celebration. But it's not happening in Canada in a major scale because I was uh, I had remuneration when I translated the um, Urdu books and they paid me well. But I doubt when I translated other Hindi books, everything, I didn't get any remuneration. The, when a translator exerts his or uh, her efforts towards translation, he will be giving a lot of time and energy. But he will be he will not be rewarded, he or she will not be rewarded properly. Next comes the question of publishers. Publishers are not easily available in Canada literature. Once I have been considered as an established writer, even then to get published a book, I need after submitting the entire PDF to publisher, I get minimum one year to get it published. And uh, the state of uh, this translation is also quite different. So translation is not a lucrative field for Kannada people. But of course, Kannada, Kannadigas, they like translations very much, but it's not available because as Vidhipa told, there are no good English translations. Not, uh, I wouldn't say negate, but not many, not many, not not many, and uh, she is selective with her words. Not many uh, translators, good translators are there. Of course, it is the position because once uh, any work from Dravidian languages, it has to come to the notice of the entire country. It has to be translated either to English language or to Hindi. Is it correct? I am right. And lot of books have been translated from, in Malayalam from Malayalam to English because immediately there is one person called Teril Shio Shankar and uh, he is uh, he, he is uh, translating all the poems, almost um, most of the poems in Malayalam to Kannada and he is publishing in Facebook and uh, we are so happy to see the different aspects of Malayalam poets and poetesses in Kannada. That opportunity, even if he is not getting regular publisher, he is doing this in uh, uh, social media. And uh, the, there are very practical difficulties in translation in Kannada, which Pratibha and we will discuss next. So to add uh, one sentence to that, See, Vanmala Vishwanatha's uh, translation of Harish Chandra Kavim and Vadda Radhani and now she is doing Malayalam. They are fantastic translations. In fact, uh, it is so difficult to understand uh, Raghavanka and in English it reads as good as the original. You know? And of course, uh, Shiv Prakash is here, he is a good translator. And you yourself are a good translator. So, it's uh, not that I wanted to negate all the good translations. But because you asked me why it, there is, we are not getting that many translations as we desire, uh, that is the reason. But with those who are doing uh, good translations, I think they should be doing more. Because Vivek Sharma's Gachar Gocha, it went from <coughs> Srinath Peru did a fantastic job of it. And then it went into 48 uh, foreign languages through English. You know? so. It's a dicey situation where you see the good and the bad and the indifferent also. Just, uh, you know, just to add to those uh, practical difficulties that uh, you said, I agree that there are not many translators working from uh, Canada to English. But I think, and these are practical problems that I see in my work. Like Bhagavan said, it's not financially uh, very lucrative lucrative or viable because I do also a lot of other works apart from uh, literary translation, which are uh, uh, 
business translations are a lot more uh, lucrative. No, I don't think you should look at it that way because when I translated uh, Vedegarika into English as uh, Gangster's Gita, there is a contract and you get 7.5% and it is, yeah, it's okay, 7. 15% is the royalty given for a translation book and the, which is equally divided between the author and the translator and 7.5% was okay for me. You know, and even when I did uh, Anand Nail Content's book, uh, The Saga of Shivagami, I got 7.5%. Everybody got uh, fortunate, like yeah. No, what they meant was to do it exclusively today in terms of money. It's, it's not a living wage. And that this is a problem we see not just in Canada, but then I think in the whole world of translation, this is pretty much the same. And I think, and I speak only in terms of Canada, a lot of times uh, it's very hard to get uh, translation rights also. I think a lot of contemporary or copyright issues. Because a lot of contemporary writers that are found uh, very easy. You just call them up, talk to them and you get uh, uh, I'm very rights. sorry to interrupt. Every day I get a call from a writer asking me to translate. I'm sure ma'am. Every day. Everybody wants to be translated to English. So every day they will come and they ask me to translate. That's, that's very yours is an exceptional case. Yeah, exactly. Yours. Yours. It's an, you know, like you mentioned, you've been doing it for the last 50 years. What I meant to say is when you're starting out, I'm super new in the world of uh, translation. So it's very hard. So it's very hard for good or bad or any translators to emerge because this there is a certain uh, lack of accessibility that we have, and that and to cross all those barriers when there is no financial uh, feasibility becomes very difficult. That's what I wanted to say. It's not like uh, you know. Obviously, maybe 20 years down the line, it will be very easy for me to. Uh, Maybe authors will get in touch with me and uh, you know ask me to translate and all that. But when someone is starting out, that's what I meant to say. Practical difficulties, you know, to be able to step outside of these practical difficulties becomes very uh, uh, difficult. That's that's what I meant to say. Actually, uh, if I may add to that, see, it is uh, ignorance is uh, cannot be uh, considered excuse, you know. Because if 10% is the royalty and if you negotiate, you can get 5, five and 5 or 15. It, I mean, it's, the system is already there. See, when we translate from English to Kannada, we negotiate for 10% and then the 5% is given to the translator. The system is already there. It is just that people, when they don't know, then all these things will happen. One more uh, practical difficulty is contacting the author because I wanted to translate Gunther's Devudi. Devudi is a uh, threshold from Urdu to Kannada. And I know I sent many emails to him and then I could not, uh, even today he has not contacted me. It is hard to get contact with the author. Difficulty. And there is another one difficulty is literary translation significantly differs from any kind of translation. Just the volume of the text sets the translation endeavor apart. Tackling a piece that runs in the region of hundreds of thousands of words is not an easy task nor is attempting to recreate poetry in another language without losing the magnificence of the source text. How poetry is to be translated against the original text, uh, poetry uh, retaining or retaining the uh, essence of the cultural uh, uh, impact that is also very important. Issues that we navigate as translators and politics and language talks. How do you define, how do you uh, sort of translate a particular text? And in that context, it's, a, it's uh, nice that you brought it up. This is something I wanted to uh, sort of introduce here that you know, we talk about uh, female uh, oriented text. So, Texts that look into the like like uh, like your work for example you look into the issues of women uh, there is 
loosely, I mean, even if you might not call it so yourself, these are loosely what we might call feminist texts. So what I wanted to kind of ask was, how do you, is, is there something oh, called a feminist uh, translator? Someone who looks at the, the practice and art of translation through a female gaze, through a feminist uh, uh, sort of uh, gaze when they're translating. Because I think we can agree that uh, any text becomes very diff different if it is translated by a male translator versus a female translator. So it's just something, I mean, I, I, I'm just very curious whether there is something called uh, a feminist uh, translator. Actually, see, you translate something that you personally like. If I don't uh, resonate with the feelings or the thoughts of the original author, you will not translate it. See, I have uh, translated hundreds and hundreds of poems from other languages into Kannada because I like those poems and what they say. Okay. And uh, from Kannada into English, I have translated only those poems that I personally like. You know? So I have to think, if somebody pays me a lot of money and asks me to translate something which goes exactly opposite or you know, contrary to the feminist beliefs, I don't know. I don't know. I have not been put into that condition yet. This is the first time I am hearing feminist translator that Deepa has labelled. Uh, we cannot classify uh, roughly in that manner because a branch of literature or a branch of law, it has to grow in its own uh, pace at the historical moments and historical events. That's my conception. Because, I will give you an example. In 1864, when a woman, she wanted to practice law and she applied to Wisconsin University to grant her license to study law, the council turned down her application and said, what woman practicing law, go, go to your home, tend to your children, it is very hard, you cannot, uh, I mean, um, absorb the essence of law, you cannot interpret it, you cannot execute it and you are not allowed to study law. But, I tell you my friends, nowadays a new branch of law has emerged which says feminist jurisprudence. Jurisprudence itself is labelled on feminism. So, so many laws beneficial to women have been legislated, interpreted, executed and explained. In the same way, the first time what I have heard from Diva, the feministic uh, translator, I think, I wish and I, I, I like from bottom of my heart that such a brand should establish, grow and emerge because today we need lot of feminist translators and so that our woes, our happiness, our sorrows, our challenges, our struggle should be understood by other people, other culture and throughout the entire world, the sorrows and happiness of Kannadiga women should be understood. That positive aspect and positive change I welcome. Actually, I want to ask Deepa. See, I translated the early in Hutton's uh, play. Uh, it's called uh, Before I Take the Stand. I dream before I take the stand. And it was translated into Kannada as Katakatege Munna. It is an interrogation of a rape victim and the lawyer. Uh, it's a one-act play and a brilliant play. But it was written long back, 20 years ago. And in America, they have revived it because it is as contemporary as it can get. And in Canada, it sounded like a Canada play. Would, would, would you brand, brand me as a feminist translator? Because I did early in Hutton's plays, because I also did two more of her plays, and I plan to bring out a book of that. But uh, I, I mean, that was just in uh, passing I said that. I think what you men mean by feminist translator is 
to take out those issues that talk about uh, feminism or you know feministic point of view and translate that or if there is a viewpoint in the original which is contrary to the feminist idea then don't do the translation i i wouldn't do that in, in that sense you could call me a feminist translator yeah that's exactly and i think uh, in the world of translation i think everywhere whether it is in kannada or any uh, any language any world language i think uh, more and more uh, male authors are translated there's always this uh, this distinction compared to the number of male authors who get translated the number of women writers who get translated is very low so that's what i was just kind of proposing it if there is someone like you mentioned i mean we only translate texts that we resonate with or that that we like so if there are more uh, feminist writer a uh, feminist translators who are looking into different texts my only wish is a lot more uh, writings of women will get translated into english or into any other uh, languages that's the only uh, uh, angle i was looking at ஒர்க்கிங் as a commitment if somebody has got commitment towards feminism it's well and good if one doesn't have any commitment we cannot compel any translator actually i want to ask you question you if uh, the translations are taken up based on that as i mean based on the gender i think it is mostly based on the book if there is a good book irrespective of the gender it gets translated in fact some of the translations i did of other uh, cultures across the globe there is uh, neither the female or the male the neuter gender so when they talk about uh, in poetry especially when they say her, her so or the, the dead in fact like uh, last month we released a book by poems by mani rao and when she said the death as her and when she's talking about the lover it is actually the other woman so without knowing that i had translated all that uh, you as the male gender and then when i took it to her she said no it's a, it's a love between uh, lesbians so gays lesbians so when you translate you need to take that also into consideration and i don't think these days the translations are based on gender it is beyond gender i feel like today i was talking to some of the uh, poets who are in the queer uh, session now and uh, we were talking that how the queer literature is accepted into the mainstream now and we are not talking based on the gender anymore i think the reason i started uh, sort of thinking about this question is uh, i speak i mean i don't speak my family speaks havyaka it's a sort of a dialect of uh, kannada from uh, coastal uh, karnataka side it's a always our just like in canada she is the best uh, at this this really gets my good every time because a woman is always uh, referred to as adu as it uh, so i was with somebody i was talking to somebody about this the other day and uh, if you are staying and we were talking about how if you stay true to true to the text then you would have to say you can't say she is going you would have to say and it is uh, translated into english whereas uh, the moment you say she is going or she went or something like that you think it she then you are kind of removing the essence of what uh, uh, you know havyaka language is we are very against the calling uh, calling any woman it but uh, so this is what led to me thinking about you know the politics of language that comes in when we uh, look at it from a female uh, point of view and uh, i think i mean i had a lot of things to discuss but i think we've run out of time uh, could i ask the audience uh, in in case anyone has any questions any questions yeah could someone give
Russian literature and Chinese literature that you and French also, you are reading in translation only. We didn't read the original. And even uh, Marquez, we were talking about Marquez. Marquez's books you have read in translation only. We don't know how it sounds uh, original in Spanish. So it is just that you are good, even in Sanskrit. Because you are telling what the original author says in another language. If you are a good translator, you can do 100% justice to that. Okay. Just, just to add to that, I think remember that no translation is perfect with quotes. There's nothing called, there's nothing called uh, uh, perfect translation. So a translation is always... Uh, dictated by the translator's personal experiences, uh, the social uh, situation that they find themselves in, the, whether they are translating it uh, you know, 50 years ago or uh, like for example, uh, when D.K. Ramanujam, there's this famous quote of his that uh, he says, we should begin the act of uh, translation by recognizing uh, its impossibility, that you cannot work with Sir, there is nothing called a per perfect translation. I think. Not to be poor. So there was this person who wanted to ask. Sir, sir. Hello. Ma'am, I am from Chennai. I am a bilingual translator. Ish. I have a genuine query. Why is it that the original authors, if they write in their own mother tongue, if they themselves translate this kind of phenomenal success, what would be the reason why? Can you repeat? We got you the first part of the question, the second. No, the original authors in Canada or any other language, if they write in their original language, they themselves try to translate it in English. I haven't seen any uh, book. Normally, we are greater than the book of this Why could, what could be the reason behind it? So there are many bilingual uh, poets, and they do. See, if, if I'm translating my own poems, I re-render them. So I have the freedom to make it, you know, take liberty to render it in English, to sound it like it is written in English. Okay. Which, if somebody else translates me, 
they may not have that liberty. Oh, it's the other way yeah. around. What I'm trying to like, novel. Let us uh, leave alone poetry part. If it is novel, like I don't know what to put names, but yeah, we can say okay. Movie. Great impact, the resonance. And when I read the same thing in the English, so we say this should be gay and all, you know, and more like. Again, sir, the so the impact you cannot uh, quantify. How do you measure impact? No, you see, mean, you see, mean, see, see for example, Kamala Das's poems, as Madhavi Kuti she wrote in Malayalam, as Kamala Das she wrote in English. You cannot measure the impact. The English readers call her a great poet based on her English poems and uh, Malayalam uh, readers call her a great poet based on only on her Malayalam poems. So, you, I don't think you can compare that way. But I think uh, what you meant was, uh, so for, uh, one of the arguments about uh, Ovi Vijay's Kashakinda Itihasam is that uh, he almost rewrote it in English instead of I think he translated it uh, some 30 years after he wrote uh, Rohani Malayalam. Exactly. I think uh, it's the authors that there's, I think, um, uh, I don't know if you've come across this uh, essay by Jampa Lehri. Yeah. Because uh, she she recently published a collection of essays called Translating Myself and Others. So she uh, she she draws out a lot of arguments. So she, she tried translating her uh, Italian uh, original text into English. So she has a lot of uh, decision, uh, lot of reasons why she didn't want to do it. So I think it's a personal decision of the author. But personally, I wonder whether you will be compelled to edit when you, uh, you know, this, this compulsion to edit might be more is what I, you know, I've never tried it. I've never translated my own works, but maybe that's there. This compulsion to edit when you write, uh, when you translate your own work. It's just, uh, Somebody has sent a question saying, what are the Kannada poems inspired by you and translated into English? I've translated a lot of these younger poets actually, Rajendra Prasad, Tina, and uh, a whole lot of them actually. That could be either because it was required by Kannada Bharati or Basha Bharati or somebody, or even Rajshekar Bande. And uh, I have translated one whole bunch of the younger poets. But that was because uh, it was asked by an organization for a particular uh, edition. One translation sample I uh, am going to give you. There is uh, one English translation of Kannada poem wherein it stays the veil you put on your head that is called as Seragu in Kannada. Saragu is the sari veil what the woman put on her head. It was translated into English like a piece of cloth put on your head. When you, when you read it, you can just flop like, like you know, no. And that's all. That is how uh, some translations they make us laugh and some original translations are there which make us to uh, weep with the translator also because it will be so sensitive. Others, other translations will, be, will, will not reach near the originals. That is the problem with the translators. The translator should absorb the originality and come out with the originality that is what needed. Can I ask a question? And there are so many Malayalis who know Kannada. I mean, they speak Kannada, but it's very difficult to translate Kannada with Malayalam. Because, for, exa for an example, uh, Vyavasaya in Kannada means agriculture, but for us it is something different here. That is industry. That's a, the that's a meaning of the word here in Malayalam. So it's, it is actually very difficult for a Malayali to translate Kannada. But my question is not about Kannada translation. Uh, two years ago I was asked to subscribe a Kannada journal titled Arhu Kuruhu. It is published from Bank in Mysore. But and there are serious words in it. But I am found much 
uh, very ingly. Uh, Canada magazines that published singles work. Because most of them are for politics or such work. So can you suggest the names of some magazine magazines that publish serious literature, I mean uh, stories, poems, etc. Is my question clear? Yeah. Look, there are a lot of uh, magazines that are publishing good uh, poetry and current poetry. Uh, Kannada Malayalam, Malayalam Kannada translation is very rich, extremely rich. In fact, there are some very famous uh, translators from Malayalam and Kannada to Malayalam. If I say, for example, Dehli Shekhar. They have been translating uh, Gangadhar actually. There are a series of them who are doing very good translation of Malayalam and Kannada words for a very, very long time. Very long time. And uh, most of the magazines, you know, they publish. Immediately they publish. So they, I wouldn't call them pulp, even Arun is not a pulp magazine. It's a serious magazine.